Um, so, uh, yes, there has been a recall of CPAP machines manufactured by Philips, uh, and I want to go into it a little bit. First, uh, let's talk about uh, some notable recent mass torts include Elmeron, um, NEC, which is a, a terrible a, a condition of the of the gut that you can get in a premature infant, uh, the suntan lotion recall, and finally the one we're going to concentrate on is the Philips CPAP. Uh, Elmarin is a um, drug that's used for interstitial nephritis, a bladder condition, and it was found to cause pigmentary maculopathy. It was not warned about, uh, can result in serious eye injuries. Uh, NEC and infant formula. NEC is the necrotizing enterocolitis. Um, infant formula that's fortified with cow milk as opposed to human milk can greatly increase the risk of this happening in premature infants. And it's, it's a terrible and sometimes fatal uh, condition. So there's a there's mass tort claims related to that. Johnson & Johnson discovered that there's benzene in some of their uh, suntan lotions uh, uh, benzene is one of the few chemicals rated category one by the by IARC, which is the international uh, committee that uh, reviews uh, um, uh, chemicals and their relationship to cancers. Uh, and uh, I guess parents would be surprised to find that the uh, uh, suntan lotion they're putting on their kids could lead to leukemia. Uh, so those are very very serious cases, particularly pediatric cases. But we're here to talk today about the fourth one that's current, and that's these Philips CPAP machines. Um, this is a copy of the part of the recall notice that was issued uh, by Philips relating to a specific number of their machines. Uh, what was happening to the machines is, uh, what, what is going on? I'm getting the wrong one, but all right. So first of all, Philips is the largest maker of these CPAP machines. And they have millions of devices subject to recall. Uh, in case you don't know someone that has one or you don't know anything about them, what is a CPAP and what is BiPAP? Two types of machines. They're both mechanical devices to assist with sleep apnea. The FDA definition is uh, essentially a home care ventilator. So uh, most of your CPAP machines are for home, but it also applies to nursing homes. And it's for the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea through positive air pressure, okay? Um, sleep apnea, what's that, okay? It's abnormal sleep, breathing during sleep for various reasons. As a result, people don't get oxygenated. They have pauses in breath when they sleep. They, they get lower quality sleep. Your oxygen supply goes down. Uh, people typically wake up. There's typically uh, loud snoring. Um, there's a... Uh, uh, can be uh, other serious health consequences from this uh, extensive low oxygen period while you're asleep. Um, it's, it's fairly common. It's the most common sleep disorder in the US. More affects men than women, can affect children. Estimated five to 10% of Americans have it, but only about 10% get diagnosed. But the potential number of people affected is 30 million. Uh, diagnosed is probably around 3 million, and there are millions of these CPAP and BiPAP machines out there in the world. There are three types of sleep apnea. One is obstructive, where the back of the throat, uh, just from either the way you're sleeping or because of muscle weakness or because of some other problems, actually obstructs the air from going down into uh, your lungs. The second is the central sleep apnea, which originates in the brain. Your brain system for controlling your muscles is somehow off and therefore you either breathe slower or shallower or even stop sometimes. And then some people have a combination of both, uh, mixed sleep apnea, so they, they really have a serious problem and they need treatment. Um, so why CPAP and BiPAP? C stands for continuous, BI stands for bi-level. The difference is that on a CPAP machine, the pressure is continuous. It doesn't change. It just blows air in to increase the oxygen, whether they're taking a breath or if they stop breathing, it just keeps pumping at the same pressure. A BiPAP machine delivers different pressure on inspiration and expiration. 
so that it assists in reduction of CO2 because that's what happens when you exhale. So it assists not only with inhalation, but exhalation. It's a more complicated machine to use, more frequently used in a nursing home or a hospital. All right, so what are the uses? Uh, because CPAP only delivers one pressure setting, uh, it's best to use in situations of hypoxemia or low oxygen. So it does the following. It obviously increases the amount of oxygen, reduces the effort of the body to breathe, uh, essentially by increasing the pressure in your chest. So pushing your chest outward, and then that uh, makes it easier for your cardiac system to work. And it helps deal with a lot of the problems associated with hypoxemia. BiPAP, the difference is, as I mentioned before, it does two pressures and it assists in the removal of CO2. Obviously a buildup of CO2 uh, can be a negative and you know, like anything else, enough CO2 buildup will kill you. Um, so uh, it, it, it assists in that duplicate way. So uh, as opposed to sleep apnea, a reason that you might need BiPAP instead of CPAP is if you have some kind of chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, like black lung or some other type of industrial uh, uh, scarring of your lung, uh, uh, if you have obstructive sleep apnea that we discussed already, uh, some people who are very obese have trouble ventilating while they're sleeping, it's related to that, or you could get it temporarily for pneumonia and asthma flare up for breathing after an operation or you could have, as we mentioned before, a neurological disease that disturbs your breathing. Um, that's just a picture of what these things on the home version look like. Um, you know, I can't imagine sleeping with that on, but on the other hand, if you find yourself waking up all night out of breath uh, or feeling like you're suffocating and you can sleep with that, I'm sure it is a great aid. So why was it recalled? Well, first, they used a polyester-based polyurethane um, foam to keep the noise from the device reduced. It's just a sound reduction padding. And what was happening was this is breaking down and black debris from the foam uh, was getting into the air pathway and could be inhaled or swallowed by the person using the device. So in their own laboratories, they discovered this was happening. Now, there were a number of complaints so in, in, in case you don't know, you know, complaints to the FDA about either devices or drugs are put in the MAUD, M-A-U-D-E system. MAUD stands for something. I don't remember what the acronym stands for, but it's all the uh, voluntarily reported complaints about devices or drugs that are accumulated by the FDA over time and through which companies like Philips or Johnson & Johnson or any, any other company that manufactures drugs or devices are supposed to look at on a reasonably periodic basis to determine if there's problems with their products. A number of people complained. Phillips did some lab research and saw they had a problem, notified the FDA, and this is essentially a voluntary recall with the agreement of the FDA that the, the recall devices should not be used. In addition to that, the foam itself may off-gas some chemicals, meaning that just by its very existence, the foam will over time, give off gases, and naturally, if it's involved in an inhalation device and it gets into that system, you're going to be inhaling these chemicals. Um, you know, we inhale chemicals all the time um, in industrial settings, um, uh, on the street, uh, and the body can usually battle off uh, the effects of these chemicals when the adducts from these chemicals harm our DNA and could potentially cause tumors. Uh, you know, tumors are essentially just cells that have gone wild uh, because their DNA has been altered and they have uh, no restraint on growth uh, and they eat up everything around them and the body has, doesn't recognize it as a foreign cell and doesn't battle it. So um, uh, naturally, if you get, at any time you get added uh, genotoxic or carcinogenic chemicals added to your exposure, you run the risk of exceeding your body's ability to fight this off by either repair or uh, death, cell death. And uh, you run a possibility or an increased risk of cancer. Um, 
the, the lab analysis found in this case that the degraded foam produced several chemicals. One is uh, toluene uh, uh, diamine and toluene diastocyanate. Um, these are uh, used in industry. And so studies of people who work in those industries have shown increased risks of uh, cancer or genetic defects, um, et cetera. Another is a diethylene glycol, uh, which is a skin irritant. And all the cancer research now indicates that repeated irritation or inflammation uh, is one of the main causes of cancer developing. Uh, and finally, uh, during lab tests, two um, uh, chemicals, uh, dimethyldiazine and phenol, I'm not gonna try to pronounce the rest, uh, are toxic gases uh, and the uh, FDA and the EPA have established safe exposure levels. Uh, and these gases exceeded those safe exposure levels. Just a, a word on safe exposure levels. The FDA and the EPA uh, established exposure levels uh, which would keep any of these chemicals below a point where it would add more than one additional cancer in 100,000 people over a lifetime of exposure. So that's a very, very, very low level. Um, but uh, when things exceed that level, either in a workplace uh, or you know, for occupational purposes like EPA purposes or in a Superfund site or in a machine like this, uh, there, there are calls to get rid of it because you know, these uh, are estimates. They don't really know um, often what these uh, uh, chemicals might cause or how much the risk is. Uh, you know, you can't study people. You can't expose people to chemicals to find out how many get cancer. You have to use laboratory animals. So it's difficult to find out. Um, so which machines are recalled? Uh, I don't think you need to take notes or, 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 or memorize these. Um, as I said, I'll make this um, uh, available or you can just look up the recall notice. It, it's, on the, it's on the internet. Um, but uh, various CPAP and BiPAP devices, some continuous, some non-continuous ventilation. Uh, some systems are only used in hospitals, like the trilogies. Uh, some are used in nursing homes. Some are used in your regular old house where you live. Um, but it's several different devices. Now, they have a whole number of other devices that were not recalled, obviously did not use this phone. So it's not every Philips CPAP machine out there, but it's a substantial number. It's a big recall. Um, you know, some of the stuff we've seen online about this is Philips saying, you know, we'll replace these. Uh, but they can't replace them fast enough for the number of people that have them. I think they were saying that they could replace them like 86,000 a month and it would take months and months before all these were replaced. And naturally these people need these uh, because they can't sleep or sleep well without them. And people in hospitals might need them uh, just for pure ventilation. Uh, uh, you know, uh, so, you know, they could die of hypoxemia, uh, hypoxemia if, if they didn't have it. Okay, um, now, uh, so when Michael and I were talking, uh, he mentioned that a lot of people in nursing homes use these types of devices. Uh, are, could there be negligence claims, aside from claims against the manufacturer for the recall devices, just negligence claims uh, related to CPAP and BiPAP devices generally. And, and so after we talked about it, I looked into it. Um, so in terms of cases that have been reported, there aren't many, but, uh, but there are some, and I, I put some examples. So there may have been more of one of each of these, but I, I put in some examples, uh, you know, simply they didn't put the device on. If there was an order for it, they didn't put it on. The person died during their sleep. Uh, the second one involved the uh, post-surgery ventilator was needed, but the, the surgeon didn't give any orders. So the nurse didn't put it on. Uh, Another situation is where the patient vomited into the mask and died. Now that relates to the alarms on the system, which should go off if something like that happens and call nurses to them. Um, and in one case, the tube became disconnected. So the patient's got the mask on their face, but no air is going into it. And, and another one related to follow, failure to set up the CPAP alarms. And if you look at any of these things online, you'll see videos, lengthy videos about how to set up the alarms, you know, for your particular patient, or if you're setting it up at home, how to set it up for yourself. 
so that you'll know if something goes wrong. Like the power goes off, the, uh, the hose becomes disconnected. Um, you know, they, you can set the alarm if your level of oxygen gets to a certain level, uh, uh, if your uh, uh, respiration rate gets below a certain level uh, so that it'll wake you up as opposed to letting you sleep when the uh, machine is not affected, okay? Now, if you're looking at clients with potential uh, nursing home negligence cases, um, these can be considered uh, you know, professional liability cases. So some states require a certificate of merit, not all, Pennsylvania does, um, Tennessee does, they call it a certificate of good faith, it's the same thing, New Jersey does, some states don't. They're, they're generally either statutory or by court rules. Um, some states have an early notice requirement uh, this is especially true for government-funded uh, or government-run nursing homes. Uh, uh, New Jersey has a 90-day notice. If you don't give the notice in 90 days, they're fairly harsh about not allowing you to go forward with the claim. And some states have immunity statutes. And, and more recently, in some nursing home case that we're involved in, we are involved in with a nursing home where um, a bunch of people, uh, over 50 people died from COVID. This didn't happen at the beginning of the pandemic, but it happened in August. Um, uh, the people came into the, to the facility and worked with a fever. Uh, they didn't, weren't using their, their protective gear and a whole lot of people died, but they're claiming immunity under some uh, federal regulations. And that's in the third circuit right now. So you have to be aware uh, when you're dealing with nursing home uh, negligence, particularly if you're in a situation involving anything that's related to the government, to be aware of potential early notice uh, requirements or immunity statutes. Um, now, if you're making a claim for the CBAP device against Philips, um, you know, there are certain limitations on product liability law relating to medical devices. Medical devices typically are not approved by a new application. So an application is the full-on thing that the FDA does to determine safety and effectiveness. All drugs go through an application process. That is not true of medical devices. Less than 10% of medical devices go through the application process. The rest get what's called 510K approval. First off, drug, uh, medical devices that go through the application process, there's no lawsuit at all. All lawsuits are federally preempted. And so even unlike a drug, which goes through an application where you can bring a failure to warrant claim uh, for devices, for the limited number of devices that have FDA full approval, there is no claim. It's preempted. Now, that doesn't apply to any of these Philips CPAP devices. But that's a general rule. Now, medical devices, uh, what can you sue for? What theory? All right, the primary theory is a failure to warn because many courts have interpreted if your state is a restatement 402A state, comment K to apply to it, if it's a restatement third K, uh, a state, uh, or if it's a state with a statute. Most of the times what, what these rules say is that medical devices have a certain aspects that are unavoidably unsafe, and therefore, there shouldn't be strict product liability, but the manufacturer is required to warn about the unavoidably unsafe aspects of the device. And then who do they warn? Well, if it's a prescription device, you warn the doc, and the doctor is supposed to warn the patient. You fail to warn the doctor, uh, you, you know, and the doctor says that would have made a difference in this prescription under the learned intermediary doctrine, you have a claim against the company. If it's a consumer device, you gotta warn the consumer. Under some statutes, like Ohio, you gotta warn both, okay? But um, it depends and it varies state to state, but it's something to keep in mind. You, you, you can't really bring like a defective design claim. Now, some courts in Pennsylvania, for example, and some other states have said that comment K was designed for something like a vaccine where at the time this stuff was all written by their restatement committee, whoever they were, um, vaccines 
some vaccines cause the very thing they were prevent, trying to prevent, like the smallpox vaccine or the polio vaccine. Some people would get polio from the vaccine. And so they said, well, that's an unavoidably unsafe product. We're not going to have people not get vaccines because they, it, might, it might have a low chance of giving them polio. And we're going to protect the manufacturers against liability for that as long as they warn about it. Okay, it's a long distance from the original killed virus, I mean, live virus polio vaccines to medical devices. Um, and uh, many, many courts, and this has not been determined by the appellate courts, think that under the present state of Pennsylvania law, once we're finally get it interpreted by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, and they have it in their lap, but they haven't decided it yet, that medical devices, you will be able to have a design defect claim. So the design in this case was putting this foam in, which could break down, okay? That was a long way to get to be careful about that, okay? Um, so what is the case criteria for a Phillips CPAP or BiPAP recall cases? All right, first, it's gotta be one of the recalled devices, but in addition, they need to have used it for at least a year. Okay, you're not going to get it the first time you use it or the 10th time you use it. And our analysis was if you continually use it for a year or more, and the longer in terms of proof of causation, the better, the more chance that you'll get debris collecting in, lung, in your lungs, the more chance you'll be exposed to chemicals and the higher chance you have of developing uh, one of the uh, cancer types that we're going to talk about uh, in a minute. Okay, Oop, I got ahead of myself. Oh, okay. Second, must have one of the following injuries. Now they're kind of broad for, for litigations of this type. For example, I mentioned before benzene in uh, sunscreen. Benzene is very directly associated with blood cancers, particularly leukemia. Okay. And it has that you know, uh, you know, they have these, uh, in terms of proving causation, they have these Bradford Hill factors. One of the factors is, you know, specificity and, you know, benzene is very specific to cause blood cancers, all right? And it's, it's, and it's fairly much easier to prove causation in a benzene case. In this case, with these particular um, chemicals, they have not been studied as completely. In fact, there's a huge difference between the studies that have been done on the chemicals in cigarette smoke or benzene or beryllium than there has been for the toluene and the other chemicals that are in here. So the studies are, let's say, sparse. Uh, as, so um, that's why there's a broad category of potential injury here. Kidney disease, liver disease, lung disease, lung in particular. You know, if, if you are, if you're, have this thing on your face all night and you're breathing in particles and you're, you're developing, you know, respiratory distress, reactive airway disease, uh, uh, you're developing mucus in your lungs or pleural effusion. Um, those, those lung cases, I think, after reviewing the science on this, will be the easier ones to prove. Liver and kidney disease, because where these chemicals go is they go into your lungs and then they pass through the barrier to your, you know, your, through your lung cells, through your lung alveoli. And first place it goes is the liver and it gets processed. And then the liver weeds out the chemicals. And the second place it goes is your kidney. And the kidney weeds it out more. And, and then it goes out in your urine. So these chemicals are processed uh, in the, the liver and the kidney. And so there's thinking that in, in those places, you may see uh, disease uh, that, that might occur. Now, um, a lot of these people, particularly if they're in nursing homes, have other, a whole pile of other comorbidities. So if you have a person with diabetes, you have a person with um, a really bad hypertension that's lasted for a long time, but that really actually is a kidney disease, okay? Uh, you have a person with interstitial nephritis, and then they're on a CPAP machine for a year, you're gonna have a hard time proving that that kidney was damaged by this CPAP machine. However, if you have a younger, healthier person, um, uh, you know, and, and that doesn't have a whole lot of comorbidities, 
then the, the proof becomes easier. Well, well, then what is the cause? Why did this person get this? So it's easier. And, um, and the, the next uh, area uh, is we're going to get is the chemicals. But one thing is the client should be a non-smoker. Now, I'm not saying never smoker like they never smoked, but a non-smoker at least around the time. I mean, if you're having lung problems, you need a CPAP and sheet at night and you smoke. Not only do you have the issue of whether the smoking caused whatever problem you have, you have the issue of a, like a contributory or comparative negligence. Like you're smoking, but you need a CPAP machine. So what you want is a non-smoker. Uh, better is a never smoker. But a current smoker is a problem for any of these cases, okay? Now, uh, many types of cancers are implicated, but other than lung cancer, proof is thin, all right? Lung cancer, because obviously you're breathing the stuff right into your lungs and it's all night, every night. And, um, you know, that's just an easier connection to make from an evidentiary standpoint. But you'll, and if you, you look online, you know, uh, a lot of lawyer firms who, you know, are aggregators, uh, uh, collecting cases, um, they'll list every cancer in creation, including the ones on this list and, and some more, okay? But, you know, um, uh, it, it's, again, looking at the science, we, our firm will look at all these, but in my view, you're never going to be able to prove all these. So, for example, in the, in the Zantac litigation, so Zantac turned out had um, NDMA, which is a really a potent cancer-causing chemical that develops in the pill itself. So people take it, you know, with food and, and they're getting exposed to this NDMA. And it's a chronic drug, so people have to take it for years and years. And NDMA causes tumors in all kinds of places in animals, just like lung cancer causes cancer. You know, like smoking causes not only lung cancer, but bladder cancer, kidney cancer, a lot of cancers associated with smoking. So, um, so you know, but there was this fairly broad study of NDMA in the, um, and, and, and the cancer causing as far as those other chemicals I mentioned here, there's not a lot out there in terms of epidemiological studies of humans with the cancer, but you should consider all these different types of cancers, but the strongest are gonna be uh, lung, liver, and, and kidney probably in the end result, okay? So um, that's just a screening criteria, uh, you know, then you have to take it to the next level. Um, so, um, the idea was to give you this information so you could alert your members uh, to uh, these various things and be able to spot potential claims and be aware of the criteria that makes it a claim. And that's basically it for today. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I might've been a little shorter than my, Michael anticipated, but, uh, and I, I see a question in the chat. Oh, it says, feel fresh. Uh, feel uh, free to drop them in the chat. So I'm gonna take this off the share and I'm happy to answer any questions. Do you have any cases, Jim, of this? Yeah, we have, we have a, a few cases. Um, um, you, know, you know, generally speaking, we, we get them referred in uh, by people that have, you know, we sent out like a notice to our friend firms uh, and uh, we've got we've got a few cases, but it's a developing thing. I mean, this is this uh, recall was at the end of I want to say July, and uh, uh, you know this is very recent. Jim, age of the machine. You know, how old do these machines have to be before the foam starts to degrade? Um, so I think the off gassing happens from right from winter mid. Okay. Uh, I don't think we have any information that can answer uh, when it starts to degrade to the point where pieces start uh, breaking off. And probably the only people that have that information right now are the company and the FDA. We can't get them without litigation. I do think a couple of our colleagues and other firms have filed a couple suits, but you know what's going to happen. This is going to end up in a multi-district litigation. So there's going to be like a nine month run up to, you know, people will file a few cases. Someone will move to have it all consolidated. 
and it'll, it'll take nine months or so before the court says, okay, it's consolidated and we'll send it to this judge and then it'll take a while for the judge to get organized. And only after that will we get discovery and only after that will we get document, you know, what every company does is a root cause analysis. Like, well, why did this happen? Okay. And, you know, it's an extensive document. They do all kinds of testing to try to figure out why it happened because they don't want it to happen again. Even if there's no litigation, recalls are expensive for the company. Uh, and, you know, give the company credit. They, they, they came forward with the information. So um, now you're really bad off if you get caught. All right. So they have good incentive to come forward, but they did. So, um, you know, and then they send a lot of this information to the FDA, but we can't get that either. OK, until we have litigation. So, you know, you, and what you end up finding out. You know. Like you do in other litigations is. Sometimes they suspect it, but they just cover it up because or they figure out another way to test it. So it comes through clean and they hope for the best. And sometimes they just missed it. Sometimes they have a foam of a certain quality it's supposed to be and then the subcontractor doesn't. I'm using foam as an example. It doesn't really supply what they were expecting or it doesn't hold up as expected. Um, but at the same time, I know, for example, with knee replacement devices, they'll take those things and they'll run them through 2 million repetitions on a machine, you know, with pressure, just like you were walking or running, just to see if they hold up, if they fracture, okay? And then the metal has to meet certain standards to, 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 to get to that. They should run these machines through similar testing over time. They also have to do a thing called accelerated testing. So they figure out ways to test the device for six months, but it has the effect of having tested for six years. So for example, on the Zantac pills, they had accelerated testing to see if, what their breakdown pieces would be if we held on to them for several years, but they did the test over three months by stressing the drug so it would break down. You know, giving extreme temperature, extreme humidity, and see if it actually broke down into something, which it did, and they missed. It. They only found out, yeah, you know, in 2019, even though the drug went on the market in 1983. What's the, well, would there be a typical symptomatology that you'd be looking for? You know, if I'm, reading something, you know, if, I, if, uh, if I'm reading a newsletter or something like that comes out and I've got a FIMBA member or me on a CPAP machine or something, probably the first thing that I'm going to connect with is symptoms, right? What, yeah. what type of symptoms should we be looking for that I assume must be somehow different once they were on the CPAP machine versus previously, especially during COVID? I mean, yeah. how do you sort of sort all of that stuff out? Aside from cancers, which of course should just have to be diagnosed with yeah. cancers. So uh, we're talking primarily with uh, 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 pulmonary problems, lung problems. Okay, so um, let's say a, a, a client uh, uses CPAP machines working, and after a couple of years, they start having trouble breathing in the daytime or they're mm -hmm. short of breath when they run. They develop asthma type symptoms or symptoms of some type of uh, effusion in their lungs. They get a chest X-ray and they, there's fluid in their lungs for, for no obvious reason. Um, you don't have, for example, congestive heart failure, which is really just an accumulation of fluids, not only in your heart, but around in your body and can collect around the lungs and make it harder to breathe. But you don't have that. You don't have, uh, uh, any other pulmonary problems other than you have the sleep apnea. And let's say it's the basic sleep apnea, the, you know, the kind where, you know, you don't have any really bad systemic problem. You just, uh, you know, you just have trouble sleeping because in, uh, the, the manner in which you sleep closes off your airway. So you need to force some more. It doesn't close it off all the way, but it obstructs it some, and less air gets in, and then you, 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 your oxygen saturation goes down at night, and then you wake up, okay, because you're your body says, oh my God, you're, you're suffocating, all right? Um, so, uh, you know, the same thing might happen if the sheet fell over your face while you were sleeping and your body, you might just wake up because your body's not getting enough oxygen. Um, but now in the daytime or when you run or do exercise, you're having problems. 
So it's what I said about morbidity, uh, not morbidity, uh, yeah, morbidity before or comorbidities. You know, if you have a person with a whole pile of different lung problems and they're having trouble breathing, that's a hard case to make. If you have a person, and even an elderly person that's in a nursing home, like my, my father, my father's 96, he didn't have any lung problems. He lives alone. But, but if he developed, if he was using a CPAP routine and all of a sudden he de develops lung problems, you know, and then they, they take him to the doctor and the doctor says, well, you've got pulmonary edema, your, your lungs are getting um, swollen. I don't know why they're inflamed and they're swollen. Well, maybe you're, in you're inhaling particles from this machine. I mean, it's as reasonable explanation as anything. So what I would say, looked at is a change in condition for the non-cancers. Uh, or if you're having liver problems or kidney problems, and there's just really no explanation of why you suddenly got this. Um, one explanation might be the fact that you're using the CPAP machine. Is this primarily affecting elderly people our age? No, no, no I, I don't think it's limited to elderly people at all. And I think that- uh, Notice he, he, added, he added our age. Jeff, yeah. He threw you in there. Well, look, I, I would agree with you on, I'm not gonna disagree, um, um, but uh, it, people who are obese uh, are very, at any age, um, children can have sleep apnea. A sleep apnea can be associated with neurologic condition that is not at all associated with your body. It's just your brain's just telling at night, not telling your 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 lungs to breathe enough, um, and they need they need a they need a, a push. Um, uh, so uh, I don't think I really don't think it's limited to elderly people. Um, Actually, it's the, the BiPAP machine for people who do have some lung problems uh, that, that might relate more to elderly people. But, you know, the, if, if you're looking at a case from a lawyer's perspective, the cleaner case is a younger, more healthy, but not younger, 50 is younger, at least for you and I, right? Um, they're very young, uh, but, you know, somebody who's younger in reasonably good health, no other serious problems going on. And they're developing lung problems, um, and the, but the only problem they have is they have this sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea uh, uh, wakes them up at night. And look, this is all, you know, we're at the front edge of this litigation. There's a lot to find out yet, all right? Nobody even knows the number of people affected. Um, I tried to find some statistics on who uses CPAP. There's not good statistics out there. There's a sleep apnea website. You know, like most other conditions, there's a, um, uh, you know, an organization for that, like, you know, like the American Cancer Society. But they didn't really have good statistics on how many people, um, what, what demographics. And I'll be honest, I didn't go into like PubMed and look at, you know, medical articles for, for, the, for that, that aspect of it. Seems like they have these sleep... Uh sleep places all over the place that are doing these studies. So I would imagine there got to be quite a few people. I, I think it's quite a few people. It's like a cottage industry. Yeah. Yeah, you, know, you do a sleep, you know, people can't sleep. They do a sleep study. So, oh, you need a CPAP machine. Yeah. So you're helping the, the clinics who are in the, in the public companies because they're selling their, their, their products. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a cottage industry. I mean, there was a cottage industry of a, a while for um, attention deficit disorder. They'd have these clinics and then they'd put people on the medication and they'd be on the medication all through their youth. And, and it was a great boon to that cottage industry and then the, the drug manufacturers. Not everybody that went there ever needed that stuff. But they had like a questionnaire, went through the questionnaire, you qualified. Hmm. Not to say that there were many, many, many legitimate uh, clinics out there that were dealing with ADD, but there were some that were taken advantage. So like anything else. And I saw somewhere in your notes that the machines 
the beginning date for these machines are 2009, manufactured yes. 2009. So yes. anything older than that, not really. Not part older. of this recall, right. Okay. But you know that's now twelve years ago. So that I don't know how long these machines last, but that would be a pretty old machine. Yeah. I'm sure, the quality of the um, the pumps and the alarms and the you know the, well, I'll tell you this. This is interesting. For Medicare to pay the CPAP machine, you have to use it. You can't just buy it. And or, but a lot of these machines are leased. You don't actually just own it. And um, it sends a signal to Medicare or it records that you're actually using it so that they could check. <laughs> so the machine does record, like anything else in your life, the machine, you know, just like Zoom is, is possibly figuring out who we are now, the machine records some data about you. Probably run by uh, Dominion Systems or Smart Tech, right? Probably. I just haven't gotten that. That I, I found that out, but I didn't. I didn't get that far into who's doing it. Right. Right. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I. I. I, I think, short of, um, you know, some X-ray evidence that you've got these particles, or you've got, you know, maybe some. Um, scarring from these particles or um, uh, lung cancers, I think these will be difficult to prove. You know, um, for example, like the talc litigation. So a lot of people use talc, a lot of women use talc and then got ovarian cancer. Um, so they're all had claims, but there's a very specific way to find out if your ovarian cancer is associated with talc, which is, when the ovaries are removed, you do pathology. Pathology uses the electron microscope. You can see the tap particles in there. Okay, and that's absolute proof. But only a few people have ever had that. So how do you prove all the other cases, for example? Okay, so maybe there'll be a way to prove that you have the particles of this foam in your lungs. But I think once that get in your lungs, that's never coming out. You're not, you're not breathing that out again. All right, so small particles of po polyester, polyurethane gets in your lungs. That's not a good thing. So Jim, I, if somebody thinks that they have a claim or somebody calls in that they think that they have a claim, you're open to talking to them about them, I assume? Sure, and uh, if anybody wants, we like have a intake sheet that we do for every master, but it takes you like gets the very basic information. And if you get past that sheet, then it's, it's worth looking at deeper. And it's gonna say, which which device did you have? And then have, next to it will have the list so you can check that off. And what what are your problems? But very, very general. It might, might be a page and a half or a page and not jammed together. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great if you could push that out. I can share it with the- Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get that out. We have uh, one of our lawyers here, is just like the queen of that. So she'll take, she'll, um, she'll get, I'll get that to you, okay? Great. All right. And then I uh, I shared your email address, I hope you don't mind, in the chat for anybody that would want to reach out to you about a case sure. in particular. Well, I'll, do. I'll send this, I'll send that criteria thing and, and, and this PowerPoint to you and anybody who wants it can get it from you. Great, great. I'll set it to Al, but I know me. Yeah. Anybody have any anybody else have any questions for Jim while, while we have him? So Jim will be uh Legal Shield is having a referral attorney um uh networking event in Kiowa later this month. So for those of you who will be down there, Jim will be there. And uh, I have a suspicion that uh, he probably will buy you a drink if you're around. <laughs> uh, well, just the people around. on the call. Just the people I'm, on I'm the taking call. your names. <laughs> so uh, he will be there for you to uh, pick his brain on CPAP cases or any of the other mass tort cases, or uh, he loves to talk about tractor trailer cases too, right, Jim? That's your forte. Yeah. Yeah. So those, those, those are good cases. Yeah. Um, I only All get right. the ones where they're complicated. I don't get the easy ones. You don't get the easy ones. No. So every time somebody uh, is involved in an unfortunate accident on the turnpike, we do check to see if they're a legal shield member. 
So uh, <laughs> now we've been checking to see if they have, you know, collision warning devices or automatic braking, or if it has automatic braking, whether it worked. Um, um, there's lane assist devices. I mean, there's all these big trucks now um, are supposed to have those things installed. And cars, all cars by agreement of the manufacturers by 2022 model year. And right now about 10 manufacturers have over 90% compliance standard. And uh, Chevy and Chrysler are two of the ones that are way behind. Ouch. So it's, yeah. I mean, pedestrian walking across the street gets run over by somebody didn't see her. You know, pedestrian automatic braking possibly could have saved that person. So, any event. Well, Jim, thanks for the presentation today and for the information. I greatly appreciate it. Um, oh, I appreciate it. Thanks for asking me. It's always good to talk to you. Good to see old friends. And, uh, I, you know, I don't mind hearing myself talk a little bit. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thanks, All everybody. Right. Have a great rest of the afternoon. And, uh, Jim, we'll see you in September. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Michael. See you all. Bye bye. bye, -bye.